Metro. Fantastic talk. Um, I mean, I think, you know, you've given us almost an almost breathless <laughs> summary of everything going on in Karimopti at the moment. But, but as I said at the beginning, 20 years ago, it was an empty space. And, and I think you've shown now that we, we understand a lot more, not only about etiology, but about natural history and so on. Um, so, Panos, I don't, we've got, a, I think, a few minutes for, for questions and for reflections. Would you like to begin? No, no, I don't, I don't like to end anything here. Actually, we are a bit late, but uh, indeed, uh, what I would like to comment is that during the last few years, the progress in this domain is huge, is clear, and uh, uh, as such, we have to be proud that uh, a number of other developments will follow in other different possibly diseases, rare diseases, and uh, other uh, subfields of cardiology. But here, in this difficult area, the progress is clear. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Juan, just maybe just coming to keep on, I'm going to ask you my, my, the first question I, you know, I talk about all the time, and it's about genetic disease in children and why, why they present early. And so, should we just rehearse that argument again? So, you know, if my, my proposition to you is that when we start from adults and we look at the families, we don't see disease in kids. So is that because we're missing it or because there's something that we're missing in, in the, the early presentations, whether that be other genetic or environmental factors or, or whatever? Yeah, thank you, Ferris. So I think, you know, that, that's, that's a key question, really, isn't it? So the one possible explanation for this, and I think this definitely accounts for some of that, um, some of that is the, the the fact that until very recently we just weren't looking for for these diseases in in children. So um, you can start from an adult pedigree and ask, you know, have any of your children died suddenly? But that doesn't that doesn't really pick up the disease in those in in those children. And I think once you start to look, you you, you do start to find that, that there are phenotypes there, and and sometimes they're you know they're phenotypes because you might argue, well, you know, if they're symptomatic, they were going to present anyway. But actually, that isn't necessarily the case. Often, the symptoms are very non-specific. It may they may present, but they may have presented five years down the line after undergoing lots and lots of investigations for respiratory disease, for other other conditions. And I think that's certainly one aspect of it. It is also the case, though, that we do have cohorts of children with exactly the same mutations that we see in their parents and other people in the family, and they have much more severe disease. And why that's the case, we you know we still don't know, and I suspect it is. It will end up being uh, uh, something related to epigenetic factors, environmental factors, other uh, other sort of genetic issues. Our cohorts are a lot purer, I think, than, than the adult cohorts. And what I mean by that is that we we don't have a lot of the confounders that we see in adult patients, like hypertension, obesity, diabetes, that sort of thing. Um, and so it may be that what we're describing actually is the sort of the, the, the true sarcomeric disease, which you're seeing a little bit, we've seen some of that in the adult population, but a lot of what you see in adults may not be that, maybe something different. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but... <laughs> well, it's an interesting hey. concept that you, you're the one seeing the true disease and we're not. <laughs> but, but, but panels, yeah, please. Uh, I would like to ask something here that, indeed, I, I should know, but I don't. Talking about childhood increase mortality in those children with uh, inherited hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, is the phenotype, the hypertrophied myocardium which predisposes to sudden death or is the mutation itself? Thank you very much, Professor Vallis. That's a, a fantastic question. I think uh, it, it's, it certainly is the case that although the rates of sudden cardiac death are nowhere near as high as people used to think in the pediatric population, they are they are higher than what we see in adults. And I think partly it's related to what we were just talking about, that our, our cohort is a cohort really of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It doesn't include these other patients with non-sarcomeric disease, with obesity, with hypertension that probably have a different uh, risk profile. But the phenotypes that we're seeing in these children actually are not that different to what you see in the adults. So they have the same distribution of hypertrophy, they have thick hearts, they have late GAD on cardiac MRI. We see non-sustained BT rarely, but when we see it, it's, it's bad news. Um, so so there, there's got to be, there must be something else 
Um, now, again, it, you know, it, it, whether that's related to the fact that there are fewer protective uh, 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 genetic epigenetic factors in these in these children or not, we we, we just don't know. But it, but it, it is a real phenomenon, and you know, the mutations are the same, and the phenotypes are the same. <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> well, you, you, you brought up the, the question of screening in childhood and you know, for, in the context of maybe family screening and uh, we're going to have a couple of questions here about the first of all the role of the electrocardiogram in screening relatives young relatives um, and whether or not you think there are maybe there are other markers of disease that uh, are more sensitive to early diagnosis in children than perhaps they would be in adults Thank you. Yeah, so I think so. The, the ECG is for me a, a crucial tool in screening um, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So we very often. So one of the nice things about what we what we do in screening families is that you see the diseases develop not just in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but in other all the other cardiomyopathies also. You see that first ectopic in the ARVC families, for example. And and what we see initially in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are ECG changes. So it's unusual, not in, not impossible, but it's unusual for us to find. Uh, diagnostic criteria for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy on, on echo without an abnormal ECG first. And you see that, you see the Q waves developing, you start to see the repolarization abnormality developing, left, 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 left axis deviation. Is it the most sensitive screening tool? It's, it's probably the most sensitive screening tool that we have at the moment that is widely available. But we do see other early phenotypic features if you start looking uh, you know from an imaging perspective for example so abnormal uh, abnormalities in the mitral valve things like crypts um and and and, and uh, structural abnormalities that you that you see before the phenotype develops and in that context i think the thing that we've seen and this is anecdotal we haven't analyzed this properly yet but actually one of the things that we see is that is this hyperdynamic systolic function mm -hmm. this exact exaggerated systolic contraction actually is what is what it is um, and whether that's just an early phenotype of left ventricular hypertrophy as opposed to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we, we don't know. Um, but it's certainly something that anecdotally, we, you know, you, you see that when you screen relatives. Yeah. I think that's that particular phenotype is really interesting, isn't it? That this exaggerated systolic thickening that we we think we see in kids. And in a way, your com your comment um, about <laughs> the purer disease in kids may may, may exactly be that because. You know, we've got this putative mechanism, at least associated with mice and heavy chain mutations, that the, the reason you get hypertrophy is because of this hypercontractile phenotype, which I don't really think we we see in its purest form in adults. I mean, yeah, we have high ejection fractions because they've got small cavities, but when you look at the muscle, it, the thick bits don't do much. In the kids, you actually see that evolution from the non-hypertrophic to the hypertrophic phase. So, I mean, sort of segueing into therapy, I mean, do you, would you anticipate, would you guess that maybe some of the therapies that, you know, we're now contemplating, you know, MAVA or you know, other drugs similar to MAVA, uh, are going to be more effective in kids? So that, that's, that's a great question. And that's, you know, I'm very optimistic about that based on the, on the preclinical studies, but, uh, but, but also based on the mechanisms of disease. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, you know, I think that what there certainly needs to be is a move towards including or carrying out pediatric trials for these for these drugs and, and doing that at an early stage. So often, what happens is that trials uh, uh, are taking place uh, take take place in adult populations. It takes a long, long time for that to filter down to children. In fact, they never do filter down to children. So we, we never have randomized controlled control trials in children. We people start using it on a compassionate basis and then just extrapolate on it. Actually, I think there's a really good argument for doing pediatric specific trials very early on in the process, particularly for these sorts of therapies that, that, you know, that do target that underlying pathophysiological mechanism. Mm. There are some few questions from the audience here. Is one asking about the role of EPS or electrophysiological studies in the risk stratification process among low risk patients with, for example, one risk factor? That's your opinion. So and, from my point, and, and from my side, as we are talking about ECG and the risk classification, I am pondering how much soon artificial intelligence is going to be involved in the risk stratification uh, through ECG 
analysis. Uh, because I it's clear. It's yeah. But uh, what yeah. about the uh, electrophysiology, electrophysiological studies in these patients? Young, uh, yeah. small ch children, etc. Yeah. So, so in my in my experience, there there really is no role for electrophysiological studies for risk stratification in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in children. Um, there has been one study, um, a small study, a non-controlled uh, reported uh, inducible ventricular arrhythmias at EP study is a potential risk mar marker for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but that's not that's never really been replicated, and and it's definitely not something that we that we use. Um, I think that's. I, I think I'm right in saying that that would be the, the similar approach in adult populations also. We wouldn't use EP studies for, for risk stratification purposes. The issue of the ECG is, is interesting. So we there are some suggestions that the ECG phenotype might be a useful predictor of risk in, in children. Actually, it's data from, from a single center, from Osman Smith's group. We, we actually looked at that in our cohort, um, and uh, it was quite a large cohort that we looked at it, and, and really the ECG phenotype, in, in a way that we could assess it manually, really did make, it made no difference to the performance of our, added, added nothing to the performance of, the, of our Hope and Risk Kids model. But, but there are already attempts at using uh, artificial intelligence and, and machine learning particularly for ECGs in pediatric hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the Mayo Clinic, for instance. Um, and, and I suspect that, that that will be an area that, that grows in, in interest. Whether it ends up being better or adding anything to what we currently have, I, I don't know. Um, certainly what we're currently able to assess doesn't seem to, to improve risk stratification in children. Yeah, it's a matter of uh, how much uh, well the algorithms will be trained and especially what is the what is going to be the size of the data sets for the train algorithms if they had managed to collect a number of uh, ecgs from persons who later became victims of sudden death that would be a, a, a reason for us to be optimistic that uh, the ecg analysis will be helpful but it, it's a matter of time of course and the problem is that the event rates are very low and they take a very, very long time to happen. So any of the of these potentially new parameters where we don't really have that much, and ECG is different because you probably do have a lot of retrospective data, um, but things like MRI, for example, it's very difficult to prospectively assess that in pediatric populations because it's small numbers of patients and actually relatively rare uh, events. Um. <laughs> So we, a couple of questions, one related to that last point. So what about fibrosis in kids? As you know, it's sort of uh, controversial. I'm not sure controversy is quite the right word, but people are still trying to show the, the additive value of assessing fibrosis on predicting outcomes in, in adults. And what about in kids? What do we know about So that, that's... Kids? Yeah, so that, that's that's you know that's certainly something. So instinctively, when you see a in clinic, when you see a child with a horrible scarring on their MRI, you you you, you worry. But the question for me is, as you say, whether this adds to what we currently have. So does the this refine our existing models? One of the difficulties with MRIs in children is that below a certain age, it's very difficult to 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 do cardiac MRIs without anesthesia and difficult to justify giving an anesthetic to somebody just to do a cardiac MRI. Um, but also heart rates are faster, the image quality is perhaps not quite as good. I, I don't think we've been so good at, at, at really properly assessing the quantity of late GAD enhancement in cardiac MRI. There are some data that are starting to, to, to emerge. But again, the numbers are very small. Um, and and you know, at the moment, there's as I say, instinctively you think, yeah, it, it may well be an additional risk factor, but actually we don't have those data. Really. There is another question, Barry. <laughs> yeah, so this is from, this is a highly informed question, um, and it relates to the to the risk algorithm. So showing that your your event rates are double those of of adults. So is 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 that is that real? Do you think? I mean, you know, it, it was always said that pediatric hypertrophic cardiomyopathy had a, a higher risk of dying suddenly? I mean, do you think that's what the models show? So I think it, it's, it's, it's probably not double, um, but I, and, and it's certainly not as, you know, the, the sort of rates of eight to 10% per year that were sort of previously quoted, I don't think that's the case. Those are very highly selected, very severe um, phenotypes. 
Um, I, I do think that you know, consistently the studies that have used population-based data have shown sudden death rates of around 1.2% per year. So it's not quite double what we see in adults, but it's not far off. It's at least 50% more. And I, th and I, think, that's, I think that's true. Um, but I, you know, I, I think that's the case. So I think it, 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 is a, it is a more malignant disease in childhood in terms of risk of sudden cardiac death. Um, it's also, as I showed, a more malignant disease in terms of lifelong morbidity also. So the, they develop, they have a, you know, a much longer period of time to develop heart failure, uh, AF, stroke, etc. And that's definitely something that we haven't really focused on in the pediatric population um, in, uh, in the past. And that's an interesting point about the, the thresholds that we use for putting in defibrillators, isn't it? Um, I mean, 1.2% per year. Yeah, but 1.2% per year in a child? I mean, that's that's substantial. I mean, you can't say yeah. that's background risk. So, so do, do you have a do you have a view on <laughs> on where the threshold for acceptable risk might be in children? So, I think the difficulty with that is that the risks of the treatment are also higher in children than they are in adults. So, you know, risks related to ICD implantation are substantially higher in, in children than are in adults. Um, and so getting that balance right is, is actually quite, quite difficult. Um, we, we did look at different thresholds in terms of which threshold predicted risk more, most accurately, and it, and it was 6%. I, I, that, that feels about right. Um, but, but I think, you know, as I mentioned before, it, it, the real value of these models is, is to allow an informed sort of consultation with the family, with the children and the parents. Uh, people's... Um, idea of risk is, is, is very, very different. Um, and I think just being able to, having a number is, is a lot more helpful to many families than saying high risk or low risk or intermediate risk. Um, so I think that's probably where the real value lies. I suspect that if the threshold has to be chosen, it'd end up being 6%, but that is probably just because it's, it's what they do, what you do in adults, and it's easier to keep the same thing all the way along. Yeah, I mean, Panos, what for example, what's an acceptable risk to you? I mean, yeah, we when we when we're making decisions about prophylactic therapy to re, to reduce mortality and so on, we I think you're, we're talking, really, about, you're talking about the adult population. Yeah. Uh, indeed, this parameter, what is for us the acceptable uh, rate to decide, does not work. As you know, never we had. Uh, taking into account the, this, this aspect. That for us, the most important is uh, mostly the injection fraction, mostly the injection fraction, or alternatively, only or together with the indisability of the arrhythmia during the electrophysiological study. Okay? However, it is, uh, it is clear that specific group of patients, let's imagine somebody with injection fraction 30%, with a QRS duration more than 140, 150 milliseconds, and indisability of sustained or non-sustained VT during the electrophysiological study, this is a combination with a five years probability to develop sudden death of around 20 to 25%. Yeah. But you see, I shape a special group of patients. But, but clearly that's because 20% conceptually seems very high. It is high. It but, is high, but there are three criteria together. Sure. Yes, even more. Even right. 30, 35 percent. It depends. There's but, two things. There's two things, isn't there? There's the criteria you use to identify a high risk cohort, yeah. which I think is is the basis of the debate we have most of the time in cardiology. But what we don't debate is what the level of absolute risk that triggers an intervention should be, or whether it's even possible to define that in 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 very definitive terms. We rarely think about absolute risk, and actually, when you look at our practice. For different disease states, whether it be hypertrophic anomalia, long QT syndrome, or you know, advanced heart failure, as you've described, we're completely inconsistent when you actually look at the absolute risk. 
preventing <coughs> terms. But also we have to take into consideration the period that we're working for. In five yeah. years, in three years, in one year, in, in, spy, in lifespan, yeah. it's, it's, it's a matter of time. Eh? Let's, say, let's talk about five years' time, which is the most reasonable. Although for one, I mean, you're looking at longer thresholds, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, completely. Yeah. I think exactly the, the question of whether five years is appropriate or not is, is, is important in children. Yeah. I think we've, we've come, we're coming towards the end of the session. One, I mean, thank you for that. I mean, we, we've actually taken longer to grill you, and I think I know it's been a rough day for you, so I apologise. <laughs> <laughs> I really apologise. So, so I think <laughs> that, that was a that was a that was a, a really fantastic talk and, a, and an even better discussion. So, so thank you very much for that. I think um, I think the audience got a lot from that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye bye.